I started last week looking at a passage of scripture that's one of my very favorites. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 21 uh, in the scripture. And uh, we talked about it last week, and I said there are three words I want you to remember, in, up, and out. God reaching in, our reaching up, and our reaching out. And uh, I think all of us here, probably our memory is still uh, long enough that we can remember those three things. And we talked about God reaching in last week and uh, how important that is because God uh, is in the restoration business. And I told you about uh, uh, when I was working on a sermon and uh, my brother sent me this, this uh, picture of a completely restored 1952 MGTD. And that was my dream car, always has been. Now, last week, uh, Buddy and uh, Emily had us over for dinner last night, had me over for dinner last Sunday night, and he had a scale model of a 1947 MGTA, which the predecessor of the, of the TD. Uh, not quite as pretty as a TD, but <laughs> sure got my blood pressure uh, up and my heart pumping. And then uh, and I mentioned this in the mornings, uh, the early service this morning, and, and Jeff came up uh, after the sermon and he said well he was at the auction in Dallas yesterday and he thought about me because they sold a MGTD a perfectly restored MGTD I said did you buy it he said no it sold for fifty thousand dollars and I said you're a wise man <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said, it's all of those that you just have to put in a museum. And I said, I don't want a museum. I want one that you can drive. But anyway, we talked about how man had found it in a wrecking yard, and he had restored it, took all the dents out, the broken windshield, the ripped top and leather, and restored it completely. And, and I said, that's what God is in the business doing. God is in the business of restoring us. And that's what Paul's talking about here. He says uh, that if anyone is in Christ, he, she is a new creation. The old is gone. Behold, all things become new. Not part, but all things become new. And that's the great good news that we have to share with the world, that we have a God who is able to make us new again. And I believe that's the number one question people are asking today. Can anybody take the hurt, the heartache, the disappointment, the brokenness out of my life? Can anyone restore me? And we have the opportunity to say to them, absolutely, we know God can do it because he's done it for us. Every time I read a story in the newspaper about someone who's committed suicide, I thought, I wish I could have spent 10 minutes with them before they did that, just to try to tell them, you have a God that loves you and cares for you and can restore your life. About six weeks ago, on the front page of the Amarillo Globe News, there's a beautiful picture of a young woman, and I think she was like in the eighth grade or ninth grade, and, uh, and our kids today are suffering more than maybe we as adults realize. Social media is a huge, huge problem for them. I mean, they put something on social media and they get uh, 10 people respond that they like it. Well, their friend got 50. So they're saying, well, something must be wrong with me. I just got 10 likes, they got 50 likes. And, and then they write things on there. And this was a young woman and very attractive, but she was having issues at school. With, and it was a lot of social media and uh, other kids were writing some uh, ugly things about her and, and writing them to her. And then one of them supposedly got her, her cell phone and wrote a, a message, uh, a terrible message, and sent it out to all these friends as if she were writing it and sending out to all these other students. And they all reacted to that and told her how much they disliked her and how much they hated her. And she went home that evening and she took a bottle of medicine and her dad came in about 45 minutes later and, and she died in his arms. And I read that story and I just say, Lord, wasn't there someone that could have reached out to her and and helped her to understand these, these kids, they don't know what they're doing, but we have a God who knows what he's doing, and we have a God who cares about you, a God who loves you, a God who's able to take whatever the heartaches and the, and the heartbreaks of your life and restore you and make you new again. And every time I read about someone who's taken some violence towards somebody, and Lord, we see it almost every week, and they've uh, racked, acted out and, and, and killed innocent people. And I, I want to say, if, if, 
It wasn't there some way we could have spent just a few minutes with them before they did that to somehow help them help them understand you you have a God who cares about you, a God who can heal you, a God who can restore you, a God who can make your life worth living, a God who doesn't want you to act out terribly toward others. Somehow, society has failed today. Let's admit it. We have failed. We have not been able to, to help people to understand that, that we, we love them and we care about them and too often we sit back and we leave them. And not only is the society, but our schools have failed. And I don't mean this to our teachers and our administrators in our school. It's our school here in Alzheimer's, but it's all of our schools. Our schools have failed. Uh, worse than that, our churches have failed. I suppose it, face it, folks, we have not gotten the message out. We have the answer that the people are looking for, but somehow, someway, we have not been able to, to get the message out and to help people understand God really loves and cares for you, and God can make your life new again. We need to do that. We need to not stop until we've been able to reach out and, and share that so openly and honestly with people and just say, God does exist and he does care and he does love and he wants to restore your life and he wants to make you new again. We know it because he's done it for us. And he has to do it for us before we can tell anybody else. Now the, the other part that, God, that uh, Paul was writing about here is not that God wants to take the hurts and the heartaches and the dents and the cracks and, and all that out of your life and then send you on your way. No, God doesn't want to do that and send you on your way. He wants to do that so he can bring you in and reconcile you into a relationship with himself. Listen to what he says in verses 18 and 19 of that passage. He said, all this, talking about the, the new, the restoration that God does for us, he said, all this is from God who reconciles us to himself through Christ, that is in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting our trespasses against us. Reconciling, what does it mean to reconcile? I told Jay I was gonna talk about accounting today, so he need to pay attention up here. <laughs> uh, uh, reconcile, we use that in a, in a financial kind of way. Uh, if you have a bank account, and I assume most of us here have a bank account, Probably there's been some time in your life when uh, things got out of balance and uh, you, the bank said you didn't have as much money in your account as you thought you had. And they sent you a note that said you're overdrawn. You're in the red. <coughs> Pay up. Now, occasionally the bank makes a mistake, but most of the time it's us, isn't it? For some reason, we didn't have as much money as we thought we did, or at least the bank said we didn't have as much, and somebody had to pay the bill. And that's what Paul's writing about here. Paul is saying, because of sin, because of our mistakes, because of bad decisions, bad choices, because of our failures, we have overdrawn our heavenly bank account. We're in the red. Somebody's got to pay up. And who's paying up for us? Paul said, Jesus. It was through Christ that God was able to reconcile us back into a relationship with himself. Uh, we couldn't do it on our own. We couldn't pay the bill. Only Christ could pay the bill, and he brought it back to us so that our heavenly bank account is in balance again. Well, it's not just used in accounting. Reconciling is also used in uh, uh, relationships. There are relationships that need to be Reconciled. Broken relationships happen in life. And uh, it's easier to fix bank accounts than it is broken relationships at times. And uh, for whatever reason, uh, we tend sometimes to let broken relationships uh, happen. And, uh, and we just think, well, there's, we're not going to do anything about it. We're, we're just, uh, you know, we're, gonna, we're just going to let it, let it go on. First church I ever pastored was in Kentucky while I was in seminary. And, and I noticed uh, soon after I got there, I hadn't been there but oh, a couple of three months, and there was a, uh, 
a woman that came to church on the first and third Sundays every month, and her sister came to church on the second and fourth Sundays every month. And I thought, this is strange. First, third, second, fourth, they're never here at the same time. I wonder what the problem is. So finally I asked someone, they said, oh, uh, they had a huge disagreement about 20 years ago. And they said some ugly, nasty things to each other, and they have never gotten over it, and they have never spoken. Haven't spoken for 20 years? I said, you're kidding. They have let something, whatever, what, do they even remember what it was? But they'd let something break that relationship. And sometimes there are broken relationships between a husband and wife, between uh, parents and children, or between uh, uh, brothers and sisters in a family and those broken relationships. Let me say this first before I get into them. All broken relationships can be restored. I need to say that to you because I know while I'm preaching, some of you are going to be sitting there and saying, well, I don't get along very well with this person, or I don't get along very well with this person, or, or whoever, and you're tending to say, well, if he knew about my case, he wouldn't say that. If he knew about uh, the problems in my life, or my family, or, or my friends, or whoever, that I have a broken relationship, he wouldn't say that because they can't be restored. Yes, they can. Now, Paul's talking primarily here about a broken relationship, our being restored, our being reconnected with God. But I think he's also talking about our being restored in our relationships with others. And there are people in our lives that we need to, to work on and be reconciled to. And that we need to, uh, to ask God to forgive us and to, to bring us back into a connection because uh, broken relationships are hurtful and harmful and painful. And, and they cause, this cause a lot of, of grief in our lives. But we have a God who can help us, a God who restores us into a right relationship with himself, brings us back into a connection with him. That's what Paul said, God reconciling, restoring us to himself through Christ. Christ becomes for us our reconciler. And God had to do that because sin is really treason toward God. And God can't just ignore it. Now, Sometimes all of us have probably said, well, God, I know what you want me to do, but I'm not going to do it. I know what your commandments are, but I'm not going to do it. Lord, I want to do it my way. I'm going to do this. I just hope you understand. And God says, no, I don't understand because what I want is best for you. And when you choose to go in your own direction, that's really treason because it's saying, I'm not going to let God be God. And when we say, I'm not going to let God be God, he can't ignore that. He can't just ignore it and pretend that it doesn't happen in your life or my life. He has to do something about it. And so God is willing to restore us if we'll let him. And if we let him, he can restore whatever brokenness is in our life and make up the difference through Christ on the cross. Reconciliation. He brings us back into a relationship with himself. Now, why do we need to be restored? Why do we need to be reconciled? Well, first of all, because God is the strength of our lives. He is the source of our power. He is our strength. We need God's help. We can't make it on our own. There are things in life that are too big, too heavy uh, for us to carry by ourselves. There are things in our lives that God calls us to do that we just can't do. I mean, to, to love people the way God called us to love? Now think about that. That's pretty challenging, isn't it? And we need some extra power. If we don't have the power, we're going to try to do it in our own strength, and it won't be long, we'll run out of gas. We'll run out of the strength and power. Uh, God asks us to serve. And we have a hard time sometimes finding time to do things for other people that need some help. And you know how it is. We need help. We need strength. We need power to give sacrificially. And God asks us to give sacrificially in our tithes, in our offerings, not just to give a little tip, but to, to give 
significantly, and a lot of people wrestle with that. And they say, well, I, I just can't afford that. I can't do that. I can't. Well, no, you can't do it in your own strength. And that's why God is saying, I am the strength and the power that you need to do that which I've called you to do. To serve, to live, to witness, uh, all of the things that God asks us to do. And when we try to do those things in our own strength, eventually we're going to burn out. Eventually we're going to run out of gas. And whether it's in your car or in your life, when you run out of gas, you're in trouble. There are a lot of preachers who have burned out. You know that, don't you? You probably know some. There are a lot of preachers. The national surveys say that ministry is one of the most stressful jobs there is. And there's a lot of pastors that have, have burned out. I read a survey, and I couldn't believe it, out of every five that graduated from seminary, within the first four years, two of them have dropped out of the ministry. Within four years, two of them have dropped out of ministry. At the end of 10 years, four out of five have dropped out of ministry. And you look at that and say, what in the world? How in the world could that happen? Now, I don't know how it could happen. I know we as pastors are a whole lot better at giving advice than we are taking advice. You didn't laugh very big at that one. <laughs> you kind of a plat chuckle, but that's right. We're better at giving advice than we are taking advice, and we're better at telling you how to take care of your soul than we are at taking care of our souls sometimes, and that's what happens. It doesn't just happen to you. It happens to me. It happens to others. It happens to us who preach the gospel. We run out of strength. We run out of power. We run out of gas. Something happened in our connection. God didn't run out of strength. God wasn't the problem. God didn't run out of the power that he promised to give us, but something happened in our connection. When we lost that connection, we began to try to do it at our own strength. And what happens when, when you do that, and you're in my profession, you start giving good advice instead of preaching good news. God doesn't want us to run out of strength and power. It doesn't just happen to preachers, it happens to lay people. You know people that used to sit on the pews of this church who were active, who were faithful, who were here in worship regularly, who served in various capacities of leadership in our church, who did a lot of good things for a lot of good people, but they haven't been here in church in four, five, eight, ten years. Why? They burned out. And you try to talk to them about the coming back, and, and it's hard for them to show any interest in coming back because there's something missing, there's something wrong, they're, they're, they ran out of gas. They ran out of that resource, that strength and, and power that they need. Uh, next Sunday night, our administrative board is going to meet on the 29th, and I'm going to ask the board to set the number one goal for the board for the rest of the year is to do everything they can to reach out to those families, those individuals that used to sit here on the pews and reach out, build that reach, reach out to them. Don't wait for them to come to us. Reach out to them and say, we need you. We want you. God loves you. God cares about you. God can be the strength that can cause you to live again. And we want you. We need you here. God is the strength. Now there's another reason why uh, we need to be reconciled to God, connected with Him. And that is because if you're not in a vital connection with God, you will never attempt to do anything that is beyond your own natural ability. Let me say it again. If you don't have a vital, living, faithful relationship with God, a connection with God, you will not attempt to do anything that is beyond your natural ability. There's a lot of people in the church that you ask them to do something, and if it's something that they feel comfortable doing, well, they might do it. But you ask them to do something that is beyond their natural inclination, beyond their natural ability or their, their talents, you ask them, and to do it, they would look at it and say, well, boy, I'd have to have God's help to do that. Nine times out of ten, they're going to say, I'm sorry, I, I can't do that. There's a lot of people in the church today who want to live on the comfortable side of faith. They want to stay in their comfort zone. They want to just do those things they can do. Now, if God shows up to help them, that's wonderful and good. But if he doesn't show up, that's all right. They can take care of it themselves. 
That's what happens to us when we're not in that connection with God, when we're not reconciled to Him, when we're not in that life-giving relationship. We only do those things that are comfortable to us, and we're afraid to get out of the boat. We want to stay in the church. We want to stay where it's safe. We're afraid to get out of wherever we might be. But you see, one of the thrilling things of the Christian life, the most thrilling thing, is when God calls you to do something and you say, God, I can't do that by myself. And God says, I know it. I'm going to be there to help you. And it just, it just stays in your heart until finally you say, okay, God, I'll do it. But if you don't come along, if you're not there, I'm going to fail miserably. And you get up and you do it. And something wonderful works out as a result of that. And you look back and say, wow, didn't we do good? That's the thrill of the Christian life. And there's people in the church that have never experienced that kind of thrill because they're afraid to, to get out. They're afraid to do something. They're afraid to, to, to do anything that is beyond their own uh, abilities. God is going to call us. He does. He calls us to do things that are beyond our ability so He can show us. He can show us and prove to us that He's a God who supplies our needs and helps us to do great, great things for Him. What great thing is God calling you to do? The Apostle Peter wrote this because he'd experienced all this. On Damascus Road, he experienced God reaching in. God changed his life. And then he experienced reconciliation, God drawing him back to himself. And Paul experienced this great calling in his life. And he said his calling was to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. None of the other disciples felt that calling. They preached the gospel to, uh, to the people in Israel. Now, some of them eventually got on beyond that, but not as early as Paul did. And they thought Paul was crazy. And he was crazy. He went out to preach the gospel and people listened and people were converted and people came to know Christ as Savior and Lord all over Asia Minor and all through that area. Uh, people responded to the gospel because their hearts were hungry and they wanted to hear the one who can restore their lives and give them joy and happiness. And Paul preached it with conviction. Folks, spiritual leadership is not by consensus. It's not by majority vote. It's not by committee. Spiritual leadership is by conviction. When God convicts you and me and says, this is what I'm calling you to do, not to preach. Now, he may be calling somebody here to preach, but he's not calling all of you. But there's something God is calling you to do. There are times in your life when somebody needs to stand up, when it's not popular to stand up. There are times when somebody needs to speak up for that which is right and best, when nobody's willing to speak up and change the direction that something is going. And we sit there too often and we let it pass by and we say, oh, I wish somebody would do something about that. I wish somebody would say something about that. I wish someone would speak up and God is saying, why don't you do it? And you say, oh, no, God, I can't do that. Yes, you can. We can when we have that vital relationship with God, we're connected with Him. And out of that connection, we have power. <clears throat> and the power gives us the strength to stand up when it may not be popular. Peter got out of the boat, and he walked on the water. And as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus, he was all right. But the Scripture says, when he began to look at the waves, he began to sink. Now, folks, you've got to keep your eyes on Jesus, because if you stand up today and you start looking at the crowd around you, believe me, they'll be making waves. There'll be people saying, that's crazy, we can't do that. Why are you doing that? Or, or what do you mean by that? They'll be raising all kind of criticism and all that. But when you have that conviction in your heart <clears throat> and you know what God once said and you know what God wants done and you say, okay, God, use me. And you stand up, you stand out, you, you, you speak out. It makes all the difference in the world. What is it that God's calling you to do? Are you willing to say, yes, Lord, I can't do it by myself, but I'm trusting you to help me, and so I'll do it. Lord, you can count on me. All of us, all of us have a calling, something that God can do in you, through you, to bless somebody else if we let him. That's reconciliation. Paul says God has reconciled us to himself. 
And out of that reconciliation, he's given us the strength we need so we don't burn out and so that we can accomplish great and thrilling things for the kingdom. Let's pray together. Gracious Father, we're grateful today for Paul's word and for the guidance of the Holy Spirit that uh, enabled him to write these words for us today that challenge us and remind us, Lord, that you didn't just forgive our sin and send us out. You forgave our sin and drew us in and brought us into a life-giving, strengthening relationship with you so we might be able to accomplish things far beyond our own abilities for the glory of your kingdom. Lord, speak to us today. Speak to us and help us, Lord, to, to be willing to say, yes, Lord, I will speak when you want me to speak. I'll stand when you want me to stand. I'll do what you want me to do. Lord, I'll do it with your help. Lord, I promise. In Jesus' name, amen.